Have you done everything you can do to be the best you can be? So Rutgers is ready to go. That is Brian Leonard. We're a legitimate big time college football program. This are you! This are you! The program is the foundation. The window of opportunity is there for Rutgers football right now. There is pandemonium in Piscataway! Great job, coach! The foundation for what was to come in 2006 really was laid at the end of 2005. Rutgers made their first bowl appearance since 1978 at the Insight Bowl in Phoenix, Arizona. The pageantry, excitement, and national attention that went with it left an indelible mark on the program and a hunger to take the next big step. It just showed us that we were in the right direction um, after coming in here and you know finally getting to a bowl game. We just felt like we were, like we were on the right path. Us playing in our first bowl two years ago now, it was a huge step for the program in order to get the younger guys ready to play for another game and then again the same thing this year. To go there and you know and fight the, as hard as we did and still come out with a loss you know kind of fueled, the, fueled for you know the, the whole offseason you know people were just ready to come in and and really really be they were just prepared to, to go in and, and attack everything head on and want to go back to another bowl game and, and win this one this time so it just kind of fueled everything. As the team approached the offseason, thoughts turned to their leader, Brian Leonard, who had a big decision to make. Me and Coach Shadow met right after the game, actually on the plane ride home. He sat in my seat next to me and just talking about the team next year, how the o line is going to be and what our expectations are for next year. And, uh, you know, I believe him. And really, I talked to a bunch of other people, my family, um, and people that had the chance to leave early. And um, they really told me his goal with your heart. For the, the legitimacy of our program, that he believed that much to pass up the NFL and to come back and do what, what he thought could be done here. I think it not only helped with him being here as a player and a person, but it gave everybody else a little shot in the arm as well as our recruiting. I think we had some confidence. You know, we came out from last season with a 7-5 record and a winning record, and um, we carried it over and had some confidence that we're going to take this team, and we had the leadership in place to take this team to the next level. I think it was them knowing that look, this is what happened last year, and this is what we have to get fixed. And if we do that, you know, sky's the limit for this team. And they believe that. I think that's the key. They didn't think it, they believed it. We knew there was a limitless place that this team could go, you know, uh, when we first came into the season. We had high expectations for this team. But um, as we were going through training camp, we really weren't focusing on uh, how good we were going to do, how bad we were going to do. Pretty much taking care of business that day and taking it one day at a time and not looking forward, not looking behind, and just taking it in stride. You know, our number one goal is, is to be a success, and our definition of success is, you know, to live with a peace of mind that you've done everything you can to be the best you can be. And uh, well, that's the chop, and our guys embrace that. Now, can I come back and block you? No. That's where you want to end up behind. Go! Eyes up, eyes up, eyes up, eyes up, dip and rip, that's good. Cut off me, cut off me, pat, you're running feet, running feet, good job. Come right at it, Ray, come at it. Good base, good base. Okay, good. Training camp was intense, you know, Coach, they, they really put a lot of pressure on us. You know, not just going to the, um, we went to the inside bowl, but I mean, I feel in that locker room after Arizona, I mean, they put a lot of pressure on us going to the training camp all season. So it was, it was pretty intense. Was it ever. Now playing football, you can't be no nice guy. The Rutgers program was indeed emerging and searching for the principles that would define them. Questions loomed. Would Rutgers' undersized, speedy defense be able to stand up to the rigors of an entire season? I think those guys really enjoyed that role, you know, the, the undersized defense. Well, every time somebody asked me about the defense, you know, I just told them, you know, yeah, you'll see, just, just wait, you'll see, because I knew how good we were. We had a lot of kids coming back. You know, when you're quicker than a lot of people, they can't get their hands on you and uh, you can get to the ball faster. When everyone on that defense, all 11 guys, has a deep passion to get to, get to the football and run to the football and hit someone when they get there, you know, any, any defense will thrive off that and do very well and be successful. Quarterbacks on the 50. On offense, all eyes were on highly touted sophomore quarterback Mike Teal. 
Run it again. He's got you, Jabu's got you, Mike's got Dennis. Largely untested, could he lead a team with weapons at all positions to the kind of cohesive productivity that translates to wins at college football's highest level? Well, the first thing we knew that um, we were going to have a new quarterback, so we had to get Mike comfortable with the offense, comfortable with the different receivers and tight ends that he has to throw to. That's it, Dennis, just settle right in there, good. So over the, the, the camp, we, that's when our main goal was just to try to get him comfortable with the offense. Uh, well, working with him all summer was, uh, you know, we would go out and we'd throw the ball a little bit, trying to, you know, get a timing, a couple of receivers would go out. Uh, I knew he had a great knowledge of the, of the playbook, so I never had a doubt in my mind that he would be a great quarterback. The summer was great for him, just being able to get around the guys and throw on the weekends with the guy to get the timing down. So when he got to camp, um, it paid off. Situations come up where you have to throw the ball away or you have to run the ball, just stuff that, that young guys don't, don't really understand what it's about. And, you know, the more you can get out there and, and play and, and actually go through through the game type situation, the better you are at making those decisions when, when it comes about. When we got to training camp, just uh, a focus and a commitment on, you know, what we were setting out to do. Different than I had seen at any time since I've been the head coach here. The season began on Saturday, September 2nd at North Carolina. With a national television audience looking on, Rutgers took the field with something to prove. That first game was a challenge for us, and they're a good team. And, uh, you know, we came out and, and fought our bucks off. Now they will try and punch one in. Left side. Yeah! Touchdown! We and they're the on touchdown. the board! Well, it was a confidence builder for me coming into the season. Um, I'm having a great first game, you know, it felt good just to get back out there. They look again, up the middle, touchdown, Rutgers in, and Rice puts on a drive of his own. It gave us confidence, especially for the defense, uh, them coming down, almost driving the score to win the game. Now, Manny Collins coming up with a big interception, I think that gave us a lot of confidence. Our offense played well the whole game, so it just boosted us for the rest of the year. I think it showed that, you know what, this is a team that's going to keep its composure in chaos. I think our guys kept their composure and sure enough Manny Collins comes up with that interception and game over. Rice's 200 yard game drew attention to him as a force to be reckoned with and to a special relationship developing between Captain Brian Leonard and him. And Ray is such a, a great guy not just on the football field but in person too. You know he's a humble guy and uh, he uh, doesn't let things distract him. He was just pushing me on and helping me telling me to keep, to keep working and stuff. I mean, the bond was just so tight, you know what I mean? There's nothing we couldn't share a moment about, even, even off the field, so I think that was real special. Next up, the home opener, and a chance for redemption against Big Ten opponent, Illinois. Every game we, get, we got more confidence and more confidence, especially after that Illinois game, after holding them, I think, zero for 12, um, third down conversion, we started to realize that we could, we could be great and we could do it night in and night out. And it was very big for us to, to play defense like that. Throughout the season, you can see we had interceptions at key moments in games. Intercepted by the Scarlet Knights. It's picked up by Devin McCourty inside the 10, and he'll take it for the Rutgers touchdown. We scored points on defense, which helped us, you know, gain momentum and things like that. We got key sacks, everything applied pressure to the quarterback. Brasic will play fake. He's under some pressure, and he's going down. Sacked at the 11-yard line. Quintero Frierson on the blitz. It really helped out a, a whole bunch. Rutgers' swarming disciplined defense went on a tear. After shutting out the Illini, they held Ohio and Howard to a combined 14 points. We expected to be that there. I mean, it wasn't like we thought we'd be average defense. We knew it would be a good defense. And after going out there in the first week and getting the turnovers and, and everybody just playing hard, <laughs> defense really like held it down. We treated each upcoming game as the first game of our season, you know, prepare as hard as we could, you know, just work as hard as you could. Stay humble. Uh, I think that was the whole key to the season, just stay humble, take every game like it's your first, and uh, that's what Coach Triano put into our heads when we went out there every week. We already knew it was going to be a special team, I mean, we knew that being those, the Big Ten and ACC was a big step to what we wanted to go. We knew it was a big um, milestone for us, but we knew that, that we had bigger goals in mind. Rutgers was rolling, 
But midway through that fourth game against Howard, adversity struck. Co-captain and leading wide receiver Sean Tucker broke his ankle. It would be his last play of the year. I was crushed. I mean, just seeing the extra and seeing the ankle broke. I mean, just seeing like all your dreams and aspirations for this year is all is gone. So, I mean, it took me a while to just get over it. So, what I best to try to do is not try to show it to the other guys, just keep my head up. So, as you see, that I'm still fighting strong and just trying to come back. To overcome this huge impact on the passing game, a group of young and talented receivers had to step in and step up. I got with Ty Corn a lot and just try to just tell him like this is your time, this opportunity right here for you to let the world know how good you are and he used the time that he had and did great and um, his time when he got hurt West Virginia game, Kenny stepped, stepped up his game. I mean that's just what you got to do in college football when the opportunity is there you just got to seize it. Rutgers ranked in the top 25 for the first time in 30 years, traveled south for a huge test on national TV against 3-1 and one South Florida. It's so hard to win games on the road, you know, in a hostile environment, especially down in South Florida. That game in South Florida, I think, was a critical, critical game in our season. Uh, you know, that's a good football team, a very good football team, very talented football team, and it was a tough game. And that game was very important. I mean, we had a long history of not winning on the road. It was a tough game, and the game we definitely um, needed for our confidence. We trained for chaos, and that game was the ultimate version of chaos. You know, it could have went either way. Rutgers went to the locker room at halftime, down by four. In the third quarter, Jeremy Ito knocked one through the uprights from 40 yards out to pull the Knights within one. With two minutes gone in the fourth quarter, Ray Rice powered his way into the end zone from seven yards out to give the Scarlet Knights a 19-14 advantage. On Rutgers' next possession, faced with fourth and long, head coach Greg Schiano left it up to the judge. Ito puts his leg into it. And the judge connects from 53 yards. That is a career long for Jeremy Ito as the Rutgers sideline erupts. In a classic conference battle, the Bulls strike back, scoring a touchdown with just 15 seconds on the clock. They need two for a tie, one of the season's defining moments. Brophy takes the snap, looks left, throws left. It's incomplete! It falls incomplete! And the Scarlet Knights hang on! The two-point conversion is no good. A great play by Jason McCourty. South Florida, I think the defense really uh, gained a lot of confidence. Uh, it was in our hands to win the game, and uh, Jason came up with a good play. And I just built our confidence. I think the defense just loves playing together. To come through at the end of that game and, and to pull it out in the end was the same thing North Carolina showed, that we're willing to stay in the game for four quarters and, and longer if we have to. It was just one of them games where it was just so fun to be part of it. On national television, to get a Big East win down there in South Florida to a great team. We went through with a lot of adversity, and we came out on top in that game. And I think it was really important for us to win that first road game um, and carry it over to the, throughout the season. For us to, to be able to be down to halftime on the road against a very talented South Florida team, to battle back and, and put ourselves in position to win the game, and then to make that final play to, to break up the two-point conversion, to seal the win, really one of the defining moments of the, of the season. When you fight through tough games, you end up on top, you know. That puts money in the bank for later on down the road, and we knew that was going to help us. That was huge for us, to come out of the locker room down and come firing back and find a way to win it. I think that really set the tone for the remainder of the year. Throughout those three Rogans, I think each one we was actually going into the game, the underdogs. Everyone thought it was a pretty good team, but not that good really yet. They, don't, they didn't think that we faced any good competition, anything like that. The victory at South Florida certainly opened some eyes, but a trip to Annapolis grabbed the country's attention. Rutgers on the road trying to stay undefeated against the 5-1 and one Navy midshipmen. The Navy, uh, that's always a hard team to play. And going down there, uh, it being their homecoming. Anytime you play a team like that, it's kind of a tough thing to get used to because throughout the whole season, you're used to preparing against somewhat normal offenses, you know, things like that. But then you got to prepare for Navy, which is basically the option attack, which you got to just be real disciplined. And no one goes into a game more disciplined and prepared than head coach Greg Schiano. Job one, stop Navy's high-powered option offense. The Scarlet Knight defense made plays all over the field. Just as important, the offense was clicking.
Remember, the offense was still adjusting to life without Sean Tucker. Young players continued to emerge. Dumps it complete to Tyquan Underwood inside the 10 to the 5, and he's in for the touchdown. Tyquan Underwood on the scoring play. With a convincing win at Navy, Rutgers was developing a reputation for being a hard-nosed, blue-collar team. And nothing embodies that more than the team's season-long mantra, the chop. Greg Ciano saying, hey, we're still chopping wood. I think it represents what we're about. Oh, the chop is really keeping us focused. I mean, it definitely kept me focused the whole year. We really did live by that, and I still live by it today. And you can live everyday life, no matter if you're a football player or just a regular job. You know, we're kind of a, a blue-collar, lunch-bucket crowd that just keeps staying on task, chopping away, stays focused on that spot on that tree, and, and you know, grab that ax firmly and, and keep chopping away, no matter the situation, just your own ability to be the best you can be. That's, that's really what the chop's about. Heading into their third straight road game, Rutgers was 6-0. At Pittsburgh, again on national TV, the Knights had to stop one of the nation's top-ranked quarterbacks, Tyler Palco. Pittsburgh, uh, them driving back, almost coming back to beat us. The defense never gave up, and then, I mean, I popped a big run to help my team out. Ray breaking the long run to uh, seal the game. Uh, that gives the team confidence, too, on offense. That game showed a lot of heart and adversity, you know. I, mean, I think as our team win those games on the road and I think our confidence grew as the season went on and I think we started setting our sights higher for bigger things after the, after the three world wins. The games on the road, they're, they're never going to be easy. You know, you have fans that support you, but it's mostly an environment that's completely against you and to go into there and come out victorious three times in a row it meant a lot to the team. And it meant a lot to the nation as well. The win at Pittsburgh catapulted Rutgers into a top 20 ranking, sparking a media frenzy in Piscataway. No, it was something new, and it was great because uh, nationally they were talking about Rutgers football. Somebody knows something. Uh -oh, give me that thing. Oh, give oh, me that thing. Oh, I don't know what the oh, heck I'm doing here, but get it. God, <laughs> oh, come on, you got it. Oh, right. Rutgers, all right. Rutgers. Just having that here at Rutgers and just getting the exposure, I mean, it's just great. Hey, you can't spell undefeated without R U. Head coach Greg Schiano tells us just how good his Scarlet Knights are. How have you been able to teach this team and coach this team and how to be consistent winners on a week-to-week -week basis? Well, that's an ongoing lesson. I mean, I don't think you ever get it. The minute you think you, you've got it figured out is probably when you're gonna, you're gonna slip up. I wanted to let Rutgers be known around the country. and Making this team known around the country is awesome. That was a wonderful experience. I mean, the things that happened around here that never happened before. You know, I think it was a, a meteoric climb as far as our media coverage went. You know, we went from having you know, slow growth in our post-practice, you know, showings by the media. Then, you know, all of a sudden there's 30 media members at one practice with nine TV cameras. Uh, that's going to continue to happen, and I think we're going to be better prepared how to handle that national media spotlight. The media spotlight also shined brightly on Ray Rice, who was churning up huge rushing numbers and gaining national attention as a Heisman Trophy candidate. You know, I had a I had a strong feeling our whole coaching staff did that that's what was going to happen this year. I mean, after his freshman season, it's great to know that uh, we have a player of race caliber out there, and he's gaining kind of recognition. It's really bringing recognition to the whole team. You know, it's good to know. Every play he's lead, he's finishing forward. You know, I've never seen a kid get tackled backwards or even sideways. So uh, just to see that from from a smaller guy, it's awesome, and it just shows that you know if, if you have the strength and the, the one-two, you're going to be a great player. Captain Brian Leonard led the way for Rice as a friend, an advisor, and as a punishing blocker. I think um, he's a tremendous blocker. I think that set him up um, for the next level because I mean, he can do both. He can run, he can catch, and he showed the game that he can block. And, I mean, he's not just a good blocker, he's a great blocker. You do have a sense of where he's going to be, but really with Ray, you just got to get on a guy real quick and he's going to get by him. And uh, really, making a block for Ray is just as good a feeling as me getting the end on myself. I've seen him like really pancake a few guys I mean, right, right in front of me. There's times where he'll pancake him, and I, I'll be like right there, and you got to make a cut. I'll be like, Brian, damn, man, how'd you do that so fast? Well, I think that's probably the greatest story of this season is the Brian Ray, Ray Brian relationship and the way that, uh, you know, an unselfish team first attitude. Ray remained humble. Ray kind of knew his place and respected Brian, his elder. Uh, 
You know, that to me, both ways, that was a special thing between the two of them, but also very special for our team to be able to witness. One thing fans were witnessing was a swarming defense ranked among the nation's best. They were punishing opposing teams. Rutgers defense would rise to the occasion in crunch time against Connecticut, once again in front of a national television audience. Big rush put on, gets away from one, gets tackled, fumbles the football, Rutgers trying to recover at the 10, still loose, picked up to the 5, and touchdown I believe, touchdown Rutgers on the fumble recovery. Rutgers went on to beat UConn 24-13 to keep its undefeated season intact. Their record now stood at 8-0, and attention turned to the Scarlet Knights' next game, a battle of unbeatens, a game for the ages. Rutgers coach Greg Schiano was at the ESPN campus on Wednesday, and uh, on Thursday we asked him, what about this Louisville team, coach? I hope I can figure it out, and our staff can figure it out here in a week's time, because uh, they look awfully good. The Louisville game is what college football is all about, and really that build up to that game was amazing. Even the week leading up to the game, you know, the atmosphere around campus, people hyping it up, uh, students just waiting outside for tickets, that says it all. I couldn't believe it. You know, I was thinking about Duke basketball, these people camp out for tickets, and Rutgers is going to be people camping out for tickets. It was close to midnight, you know, I was just finishing up, and one of our operations guys comes in and says, Coach, you got to see this, it's crazy. There's got to be eight, ten thousand people waiting outside for tickets, sleeping outside. So they said, "Why don't we, why don't we get some some peaches and bring them over there?" You know, and I said, "Well, if you guys think that's good, yeah, let's do it." The only bad thing is there were so many people. Fifty pizzas went like that. You know, I think, yeah, but I think they appreciated the gesture. Manhattan's highest honor, the Empire State Building, glows Rutgers red. A salute to the eight and zero Scarlet Knights. New York City embraced Rutgers football. And, and, uh, and I thought all along that would happen, but when it did, it was just incredible. It never happened before. It was very special. And you could kind of tell the atmosphere and things starting to change in Jersey and the, the whole pride of our Rutgers football team. The whole Scarlet Walk, I mean, I was walking down the Scarlet Walk, the fans just being there, just surrounding the, all the players as we came off the bus. And I can remember William Beckford, we're, we're walking just as we go about to go in the building, and, and, and only as Papa could say it, he turned to me and goes, now that's a scarlet walk, coach. And I, I uh, man alive, he was right, that was a scarlet walk. Ladies and gentlemen, your 2006 Rutgers Scarlet Knights! Walking out, it was just electric, and watching those white towels spin around in everyone's hands, it was awesome. Kind of had a little bit of jitters coming out. <laughs> It was kind of scary coming out and seeing all the people waving the flags around. I think we only fit 40-something thousand. It sounded like it was 100,000 people in there. It was just packed. Never seen it that bad before. It was just saying great. Like, this is what college football should be. To see that place just packed, there was just a feeling like we can't lose this game, you know, no matter what happens. I mean, it's easy to say now, but that's the feeling a lot of us had run out onto that field. Is Rutgers up to it? Their crowd certainly is. Louisville drew first blood, taking an early 7-0 lead. But Mike Teal tied the game with this strike to Taekwon Underwood. Teal to throw on first down, has some time, fires it deep over the middle, caught! Touchdown, Taekwon Underwood! The third-ranked Cardinals quickly quieted the crowd with this 101-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. But with five minutes left in the half, down 25-7, Ray Rice helped Rutgers close the gap. Trailing by 11 at the half, Coach Ciano implored his team to what else? Keep chopping. You know what? For whatever reason, I felt confident that we were going to be okay. Our guys were playing well. We had just given up a few big plays. We came out at halftime and we told them exactly the situation. This is where we are. This is why we are where we are. But if we do the things that we've talked about all week, We'll climb right back in this thing. The feeling in the locker room was we're down, but we're not going to lose. I mean, it was just a, an overall feeling around the locker room. No one had to say anything, but you could just feel it and see it in people's eyes. The second half belonged to the Rutgers defense, 
who shut down one of the most potent attacks in college football. You can't ask for any more out of this Rutgers defense than they've done. You can't explain how much energy we had on that field as a defense, and we were flying around. We traded for chaos. The adjustments helped out a lot. Uh, I'd like to say there was some great coaching epiphany that occurred, but there wasn't. It was big time players making some big time plays. With the D doing their job, it was time for the offense to shine. Up stepped Heisman Trophy candidate Ray Rice, whose second TD of the game and the ensuing two point conversion brought the Scarlet Knights to within one stroke of Jeremy Ito's right leg. Plenty of distance, and the judge knots this one up at 25 apiece. With the score now tied and the clock winding down, the stage was set for what will forever be remembered as the drive. Just over five minutes to play, Rutgers with the ball deep in their own territory. When our team took the field, there was a confidence on that offensive football team that, okay, here we go, we're going to finish this thing. They started from, I think, our seven-yard line or something like that, and I knew right then that our way to win was there. It's something that I've really never done before. It was really the first time all year where we were just out there playing football no matter what happened. Third and six, the season on the line. Teal puts the ball in the captain's hands. Brian Leonard went to work. Carrying two defenders across the 40-yard line. Brian Leonard has a reception in 43 straight, and it couldn't have come at a better time. When I caught that ball and I saw it wide open, I just took off running, and no matter if it was a defender there or what, I was going to get that first down. And when you have a play like that, you want to put it in Brian Leonard's hands because you just knew somehow he'd make it happen, and then he did. That may be the play of the year. 144 remaining. The Scarlet Knights needed to get a bit closer to give Ito a chance. It was Ray Rice's turn. When Ray popped that big run for another 20, 20 or so yards to put us in easy field goal range, I mean, my heart was pumping. Two more Rice runs, and the judge was looking at a 33-yarder with only 21 seconds left in regulation. There's the snap, it's high, spot, the kick is on its way, and it is no good. Wide to the left, but hang on, there's a flag down. I, I knew the guy had jumped offside, Clark Harris came back, he told me right away, you know, you're going to get another shot at it, he jumped offside. Clark Harris, the long snapper. Cali checks with Ito, he's ready, snap, spot, Ito puts his leg into it, and the judge has knocked it through the uprights, and Rutgers has taken a three-point lead with 13 seconds left, and they are on the precipice of the biggest win in Rutgers school history. The Rutgers defense had to make one more play. He is sacked, yes! and the Scarlet Knights win it! There is pandemonium in Piscataway, and they are going insane at Rutgers Stadium. It was mayhem on the field, to say the least. I mean, a couple of people would come up to me, oh, you guys did it, and you know, a couple of times throughout the celebration, everyone going crazy, I actually had to stop for a second and look up at the scoreboard, you know, see if it really happened, to see if it was really, really us that they were celebrating for, as crazy as it was. It was complete chaos, it was something that I've never been a part of before, something I really never expected. It was just, you know, just a magical, magical night to be able to, to share with our student body and our fans after a win like that. It was really something neat. You know, we're blessed here. You know, I really felt that God's had his hand on this program, but that night I think he maybe put two hands on us. After the monumental win against Louisville, Rutgers was being recognized everywhere, from newspaper headlines to the marquee at Yankee Stadium, and all throughout the New York and Philadelphia metropolitan areas. I couldn't even believe it happened. You know, it's one of the, like you said, as a kid, you grow up, you dream about playing in the big games, and here it is. I mean, you're here, and you won at your home field, and I had a chance to I mean, be top in the country. In a moment, I'll be talking with Rutgers head coach Greg Schiano, and then consider the three-dimensional chess game that is the mid-November BCS picture. The first of the banks of the old Raritan last night. When you play on national television and, and you play well and, and you get a win the way you did, you know, people start to, to recognize it. Despite their first loss of the season at Cincinnati, the Scarlet Knights returned to campus for senior day. 
Ladies and gentlemen, your 2006 seniors. It was a special event, marking the seniors' final home game. Four years have gone by, and through it all, we've watched these young men grow and mature as they help solidify the foundation for the Rutgers football program. Forever I'm going to be indebted, and the whole program is going to be indebted to the senior class. This group of guys who came and, you know, certainly there was enough reasons not to come. And they made a choice, and they believed in us. And uh, then they came here, and they, they did it. They, they got better, they developed. And in the end, they found a way to win 11 football games as a senior group. And not a lot of teams have done that. I think as the underclassmen, to send them guys out out of Rutgers with a victory at home, and uh, that's just a tribute to them. It's definitely a special feeling. It's kind of like an American story, I mean, basically, because it's like, it just shows you hard work pays off. From Governor of New York, Brian Letter. That was one of the most emotional games I've had in my life. When I was walking down the tower walk and hearing everyone yelling my name and stuff, and I saw my mom, and she was crying, and it got me all choked up, and I had some tears come out of my eyes, and really it just reminded me of all the great times I had at Rutgers, and this is my last chance I have to play in front of my home, you know, my hometown fans, really. This is my hometown now, I mean, besides my town in Rutgers, but it was really a great feeling, and it was pretty neat. Senior day at Rutgers Stadium, and we are set to get underway. Syracuse kicks off from our right to left, and the football is in the air, and we are underway. That final game on the banks of the old Raritan was both emotional and uplifting. The seniors were in the spotlight, and the stars of the future shined along with them. Teal takes the snap, airing it out. Down the right sideline for Kenny Britt, who makes the catch at the 10 and hauls it in for the Rutgers touchdown. A 43-yard touchdown pass. Kenny Britt hauls it in for the score, and the Scarlet Knights extend their lead. First career touchdown for Kenny Britt. Offset eye, Teal to throw on first down. Airing it out, deep downfield for the end zone. Caught, touchdown! Kenny Britt with another touchdown for the Scarlet Knights. Mike Teal came out firing, and Kenny Britt continued to emerge as a true downfield threat. But the day would belong to senior Brian Leonard. And when you think of Leonard, the mind often settles in on this image, the patented Leonard Leap. Caught by Leonard in the front of the screen. Leonard Leap! The Louisville game, I think, and the, and the Buffalo game in the past five are the two highest I've gotten. This is his signature. It's his trademark move. That is Brian Leonard. Brian will be remembered for much more than just the Leonard Leap. His captaincy and leadership are also part of the Leonard story and add to the legacy several telling entries into the school's record books. He dots the eye on second and goal at the two. Till, handoff, Leonard up the middle and he's in for the touchdown. You know, they're, they're chanting my name, they want me to get that record in our stadium. Brown here at Rutgers Stadium, chanting Brian Leonard. The coach knew about it and I think the last nine, ten plays in the game, I got the ball every single time and I took it in the end zone. Teal handoff, Leonard up the middle, to the goal line! in for the Rutgers touchdown. Brian Leonard is now the all-time leading scorer in Rutgers history. His second score of the day, and what a day, what a way to cap off the career of Brian Leonard. If you watch the replay on TV, you see Ray, the first person they go to is Ray. And, you know, he's going nuts. I mean, you don't see that every every day in college football when another running back or person scores a touchdown. You usually see that, you know, clap, whatever, Ray was going nuts on the sideline, and that really made me feel good when I saw that. I was over there doing media, and uh, all of a sudden I seen some guy come over and said, you gotta get up there on the podium. I'm like, what? So I went over to coach, and he said, get up there and, and leave this band for the last time when you're, you know, when you're at college. And, you know, that's not my personality, but, you know, I thought about it. I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this. So I went up there and um, had the football that I scored the last touchdown with in my hand, and started leading the band, and some, and the Scarlet Knight gave me his, his sword and I started swinging the sword around and, and that's going to be one of the most memorable moments I had at Rutgers and the rest of my life and really I have uh, that picture of me holding that, that sword up in that football and that's going to be in my house hanging for the rest of my life. Rutgers and West Virginia played one of the nation's best games in 2006, a triple overtime classic. 
Although Rutgers was unable to chalk up another win, several Scarlet Knights performed well in front of a primetime national television audience, including true freshman wide receiver Tim Brown. The Miami native scored his first career touchdown on a 72-yard pass reception from Mike Teal. Rutgers' young standouts gained valuable game experience late in the season, which will pay dividends for the Scarlet Knights as they attempt to reach the ultimate goal, the national championship. With an impressive regular season record of 10-2, Rutgers was invited to take part in the inaugural Texas Bowl. Their opponent, Kansas State, at Reliance Stadium in Houston. It's so exciting just to play there. I mean, just the moment I stepped inside the stadium, I was like, wow, it's a great stadium to play in. It's always cool when, when you get to play in an NFL-type stadium. The facilities in the NFL are top-notch, and to be able to play the bowl game, especially in a facility like that, that's without a doubt one of the nicest that any of us have ever seen, and that was really something special and exciting. It's just a great thing, you know, uh, strong fan support, you know, they've been here for us. When 10,000 people travel across the country to two years in a row to go see your football team play, that's passion for your program. This team, in the history of Rutgers University, has never won a bowl game, but we're going to make history tomorrow, and I promise you. Big East, we're the beast from the East. Kansas came, they may be getting more bling, but we're gonna be singing at the end. Are you? It's incredible, look at this, this is amazing. It's like Jersey in, in the middle of Texas, man. We're taking over the place. Phenomenal experience, man. I thought we were gonna try to walk like Rutgers, you know, about 50 yards and they were into the, into the stadium. But this thing was, this thing never ended. I felt this thing was moving forever, like 150 yards of just people row and row, I mean, five rows back, and people in trees looking down and taking pictures. And really, it was an awesome feeling, and you know, I mean, it was the longest crowd walk I ever had in my life. I thought it was huge, you know, and I talked to our staff. I said, man, this is as big a game as we've played at Rutgers, and I know the Louisville game and everything, but to be able to go now take the next step. I think it was critical. And to go win as convincing as we did, that, that also I think is important. Teal, quick throw right, caught by Brown. 15 to the outside, 10, down the sideline, touchdown Rutgers. Start the Knights on top. Coming from behind, Freeman is gonna get sacked. One play at a time. Our seniors stepped up on defense and they made some plays and uh, we just were determined to go out there and get that first bowl in for this team. Airing it out, deep down the left side, I thought the players did an exceptional job of embracing the game plan and embracing the cause. And, you know, to a man, I think, when you talk to our guys, the cause was to send those seniors out as champions. Ray Rice reached the end zone once in the game and rushed for 170 yards total, lassoing honors as the Texas Bowl MVP. Obviously, the touchdown I had, I think, really set us up for him being successful, you know, the defense has been playing well the whole game. We just had to put points on the board, and I think we did a um, good job of that. Here comes the Gatorade bath, and the head coach gets it. It has been a season full of milestones, and it ends with history. It was just, just great, just especially winning that bowl game. You know, what I've came here for, to win a bowl game, man. It was, just, it was just great, especially in my career like that. First bowl win in 137 years is amazing, and you can look back and always say we were, we were part of this. When I got that trophy, you know, I kissed it. <laughs> it, was, it was a special feeling, and um, I will, I'll never forget that. And I just wanted to send those seniors out with the win, and like, guys like Brown and Darnell State to you know, me because Dev Brown, they deserve that. It was 
bowl champions. And, you know, I think when the guys look down at their bowl ring and it says Texas Bowl champions, that's going to mean something to our seniors, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now. One, two, three. This season for myself as a, as a senior, you know, it, it just put a cap to, this, cap to my career, you know, going 11-2, winning a bowl game was an awesome feeling, but um, I'm looking forward to watching the Rutgers next year, and, and we're here to stay, and, and we're going to be a team to be reckoned with in the future and, and many years to come. We could play with the best in the country, and we represent the state of New Jersey, and we represent Rutgers University. It's, it's a lot of different things that and it's really something special. I mean, look at just the last three years. We made so much improvement just in those three years. Coach Gianna is a great coach. Um, I, I just, I can't imagine anywhere else you'd rather play than here. This is what I am. I'm Rutgers. Um, you know, I play for a pro team. I'm still Rutgers. I mean, this is what made me a man. I came here as a boy and became a man. Brought a lot of pride back to New Jersey, you know. Um, I've never seen so many people wear Rutgers football shirts or Rutgers hats, Rutgers sweatshirts, and uh, everyone just, um, kind of huddled and gathered around this program and uh, I'm glad that we can bring that type of excitement and joy to this state as well as the university. I'm glad I was part of it. The reception that we receive every day, whether we're out on the recruiting trail or we're out somewhere nationally doing a speaking engagement, it's, it is very, very different. There's a different level of respect to, uh, for Rutgers football and that's neat. Well, our goal was to be champions to win the first um, bowl game in Rutgers history. I mean, that that's means more than anything. I mean. It, it's, it's, it's history. That's when you look back on it and say to your kids, you know, we made history. We changed this program around. Daily big rush gets hit and he'll be sacked. Back at the 44-yard line, Courtney Green. Teal play fake, looking right, throws to the right, caught, touchdown! Clark Harris on the right side of the end zone. Throws to the right as he rolls out, it's caught by Leonard. The Leonard leap at the 35-yard line. 